Okay, on today's episode of the Investing City podcast, really excited to have Joe Frankenfield back on for the second time. So thanks for being here, Joe. Yeah, thanks for having me. I can't believe it's been almost two years since I was on last and um, we spoke during the depths of the COVID crash. I think I forgot, maybe it was like March 19th or 20th and it's been almost two years. So time flies and it's good to be here. (laughs) I know that was we we're talking about this right before we hit record and it's pretty crazy just like that was actually pretty much the bottom of COVID and we we're talking about Carvana and I think the stock was trading at like 25 or something and just just insane. I, I remember because you reached out I think in like February early February 2020 to do a podcast and I said oh yeah I'd love to do one and then COVID started going spreading and I remember having to like email you a week or so before saying I'm just very busy researching trying to understand what is going on in the world I'm gonna have to postpone for like a week or two we postponed it and I did what I had to do I'm like okay we can do the podcast and it ended up being like a day like away from the bottom of the market so um, it's a good memory to have to see where where my mind was during the crises and kind of like where there's complete uncertainty in the market so it was a good memory to have. Yeah, I mean, my big takeaway was just how composed you were. Um, I mean, Carvana at the time, it was down an insane amount. And you had the conviction to add and explain the thesis in a very coherent way in a time where, you know, like even just you doing the interview at that moment, I think it says a lot about your um, your composure. Yeah, like uh, I remember thinking of an analysis saying either Carvana is going to go to bankrupt, which is where it was trading as though it was going to go bankrupt. And we're about to go into a great depression where no one is going to be buying cars or homes or anything. And unemployment will stay at 25% indefinitely. And that was one analysis. The other one said that they had the liquidity to get through a downturn. Um, and if they did, like their competitors would likely go out of business or at least their advantage relative to competitors would increase and they would be super successful and it was the latter of what happened but like it's just crazy what has happened to used car prices home prices just what you know the inflation that we're going through now and um just i when i i pursue investing trying to put myself five years or ten years into the future and like kind of see where the world will be positioned despite the chaos that may be going on and and well, I don't know where we will be in three or four years, but I try to think of different scenarios. So maybe I said we should maybe do this podcast every two years as a little timestamp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, it's so interesting. Yeah, it would have been so hard to predict just how, you know, like all the supply chain stuff and ship shortages, just how fast these car prices have rebounded and, and then some. I mean, I just saw like the Mannheim index used car prices are up like 43% year over year. Oh, something. yeah. Yeah, March 2020 was such a, one, COVID is awful and like what has happened to the world, but like it was such a important, I guess, experience to go when you're managing other people's money. And like, I think a reflection of how I think uh, actively managed portfolios should go through where we're not trying to time the market, get in and out before crashes or try to time the lows and the highs. And we were fully invested going into the crash and fully invested coming out. And I think that it saved us. I mean, it saves us to try to not figure out what prices will do next, but think about what will the value of this company be in five or 10 years from now. And I, I'm constantly, and there's so much noise and things to try to make you think about what will stocks do next? What will they do next week, next quarter, next year? And I think we're just trying as hard as we can to get away from that, just like, what is the value of this company? And is it attractive based on today's prices, irrespective of where they have traded or if they're down from their highs of February or if they're up from their lows, like what is the value of the company and where is it trading today? And that's kind of what we're always trying to evaluate. Yeah, that's huge. And I'm curious because you strike me as somebody who is actually long-term, not just like say they're (laughs) long-term. Thank you. That's a compliment. (laughs) It is meant to be. But I'm curious about like, what's your process for updating your views over time? So you have, okay, in 10 years, I think that cash flows will be X. And what, what does it look like when, you know, something goes off track and how, how much slack do you give it in terms of updating your views over time? I've always been curious about that for you. Yeah, um, I've 
when I say I'm a long-term investor, what I've come to realize is that I'm not a long-term investor by principle. I'm a long-term investor based on analysis. And, and what really, I think what long-term investing means is being an investor versus a speculator. Now, an investor, you're trying to figure out what is the value of this asset? What is the cash that it will generate over its remaining life? And a speculator is trying to say, what do I think other people will price this uh, asset at some point in the future? And so for every asset, I'm just trying to figure out, this is what I think the cash generation, the owner's earnings will be over its life based on a scenario analysis. And if I were to buy, let's say an example, if I were to buy a bond at like 100% yield to maturity, maturity, and then some, the next day someone offers me 10X or 100X or, of, or a, a premium to what the bond is worth, and then I make a 0% yield to maturity, it would be irrational to hold on to that bond if you think that the bond is going to return zero for the remain, its remaining life. But just because you sell that bond in a day doesn't make you a short, uh, uh, doesn't make you short term. I mean, it, it just makes you a rational investor. So all I'm trying to do is analyze what I think the company will likely do over its remaining life. And then where are shares valued today relative to that expectation? And so it was, I mean, 20, ever since I've been very obsessed or interested in the stock market and investing, the last two years have been probably the craziest years. I mean, of my firsthand experience, like we try to analyze 1929 and 1974 and 1982 and, and 2000 and all the, all the different craziness in the, of the market. But we've gone, we went through the most significant crash or steepest crash and the steepest recovery sub sub subsequently afterwards. And it was just very interesting. And now we're dealing with like meme stocks and these cryptocurrencies and SPACs and, and all the other craziness that's going on. And all these different things are going on in the market. And um, it's just very interesting to go through. And so in 2020, I mean, stocks were going one to 10 X to five X to 10 X, like it was so volatile. So during that period, we have a general idea of what we think the company is valued. And if it goes up 6X, that's going to lower our expected IRRs of that holding. And so it wouldn't be rational to keep on holding that. So we do adjust it, but as a general rule of thumb, what I'm more comfortable with and what I think has generally been the right decision is to like be more hands-off unless there is materially changes in that expected IRR. And so we, I mean, from I think the last time we, we recently did some trades for the first time in like five or six months like we and we will go five months without trading and then when there's really dislocations happening in the market which I think in certain of our names have happened in the last four to six weeks and so that that made us reevaluate what our expected returns are and our allocations to those holdings and that kind of gets back into like I think what's is very important is like not trying to time the market which is a completely different analysis than what are our best opportunities today at current prices. So we're just allocating to the best opportunities and not trying to figure out, should we have 5% cash, 10% cash, 20%? We're always largely fully invested, assuming we have attractive investments. But, um, and, and I guess going more towards your question of like saying, how do we get conviction or how we might lose conviction um, as, as we get more information or more data holding these companies. And, um, it's that's hard. It's a hard thing to realize if, if there's a short term hiccup in performance or if it's really long term in nature. And um, it just depends, I think, on the situation, the specific company, the, the key performance indicators that we're tracking that we think are important. A lot of the companies that we own, one of the important KPIs that we we track is like market share. And if, if a company based on where we think the competitive dynamics for our holdings, which a lot of times are like marketplaces or platforms, they should be gaining market share over time. And that's not always going to be the case, not every quarter, because nothing is from the bottom up to the top right straight up. Like it kind of will zig and zag. And so it's, it is, it just depends on the situation if, if there really is a problem. And, and, and we've gone both ways where we have had strong KPIs that maybe weren't as reflective of the strength of the company or weak KPIs that were, anyways, I guess I can go on about that, but it's just based on the specific situation. And we are just trying to think about, is this a longer term problem or, or a shorter term problem? If there is a problem occurring, um, I, you can look at the most successful 
investments of all time, Apple, Google, Facebook, at least in, in the last cycle. And you can go back to like AT&T or, or um, Western Union or any of the going hundreds of years back. Um, no company has a perfect quarter every single quarter or every year, every single year. In 2016, Apple had declining profits and losing market share in China. And, and I remember the headlines in 2016 talking about how Apple's done there. And it's been a, one of the best performing stocks since. And so um, trying to get the cipher, the noise versus the signal, it's, it's everything in investing. It's everything in life and trying to figure out what's important and what's not. And it's kind of the, if you can figure it out and can figure out what is, is signal, it's a competitive advantage in, in, in life and in investing. Totally. Um, so I'm even curious to drill down one level deeper on that of what are some things you've, or some principles you've found to really ferret out that signal versus noise. And you mentioned a short-term versus a long-term issue. Um, yeah. Are there any just lessons you've learned over time of really trying to, to hone in on signal? I try to have this mental exercise where I'm sitting at this desk in my office, this is my home office, and it's the year is 2030 and 2031. And I can look back and think about the data or the headlines or the, the, the news that was still important to those companies or, or whatever situation you're analyzing. And that uh, I've come to realize most of the things I reported in the papers aren't going to have a five or 10 year uh, lifespan or a value over the life. There are certain things that might come about that, that will kind of pivot the company and, and are important. I would say like, I think we're going to talk about Redfin later today and, and Zillow getting out of eye buying is significant. Like that's something that you want to dig into and understand what's happening. Is that impacting Redfin, an investment that we're interested in and, and or Zillow? Like that's changing the actual business or um, COVID is important. <laughs> like uh, understanding how that might change society and, and people's interactions with each other. Will people go to hotels and fly on airplanes or go on cruise lines? Like that's analysis that you, you probably want to relook at during a huge um, event. That was a black swan event that people didn't really predict. Um, and so there's things like that, but like figuring out if, the sell off or interest rate, like interest rates, foreign exchange, like GDP numbers, like that stuff is generally that's it goes in one ear and out the other for me. When someone's telling me about like monthly or quarterly web traffic, that usually isn't that much of a signal. Like um, I remember we'll talk about GoodRx, I think too. Like in in June or July, we're getting this data that the the search for that for GoodRx was going down or something, or or the viewership was going down, and you have this long-term track record, five, six, seven years of them gaining market share and increasing engagement. And like having a month or two isn't significant to me. Now that did end up becoming a year, like annual thing. And then two years and you start considering like, well, maybe they are losing market share. Maybe it's something I need to pay attention to, to a greater extent. And um, it's all dependent, I think, and what you think is important, but it really is this mental exercise. Like, Will I be talking about this in five or ten years from now? And most times the answer is no. <laughs> and so it's a it's what's what's the lifespan or value of of this data? And so it's a it's it's not easy, but it's trying to trying to decipher the noise versus signal. Yeah, that's great. Super helpful. Just even that mental exercise of you know what's going to be important. Um, I think that's such a, a great simple truth. I, I'll go further because like going, you want to go forward to like kind of figure out what's important. And as a, another test, go backwards to the year 2010 or 2000 and try to be like, could you have predicted Google, Apple, Facebook? Could you have predicted what happened to AT&T, GE, GM? Like you just do this, look at the largest market cap of, the, of all the companies and see how that's changed over time. And what you do find if when I'm sitting in 2010, could I have seen what happened through 2020. And, and you realize it's really hard to figure out having a few important ideas or a few things that did have that type of value. And so it's kind of, so that will help you gauge what you can predict today going to 2030 to 2040. Like it's, it gets really difficult going out 20 years, but um, so that helps you kind of see decipher like going back to then help extrapolate going forward. 
Yeah, that's really interesting. That's a great exercise of, I mean, I'm sure it's hard to kind of not be biased of like, oh yeah, I could for sure see knowing, you know, the end game, but really trying to put yourself in, in the shoes of, okay, 2010 based on market shares and, and everything else. Yeah, that's a really interesting case study. Um, but we mentioned the two names that we're gonna talk about. So let's start with GoodRx maybe. Um, just tell us a little bit about the company. I know that there's uh, some unique aspects of it, but uh, um, yeah, just, just give us a little bit about the, the company. Sure, yeah. I'm not sure how familiar your viewers may be with GoodRx, but when we look for companies, I'm always trying to ask the question, what is the problem they're trying to solve? Um, why are customers hiring this company? And then the next just as important question is why can't other companies solve this problem to the same extent today or into the future? And so it kind of gets into, I guess, Hamilton Hamel Helmer's seven powers where like you need an advantage and then you want to know why that's durable. So like today there's an advantage. So anyways, to get into GoodRx, they're essentially uh, easy, I guess, analogy would be like the price line or uh, the Expedia of prescription drugs. Um, consumers go on to GoodRx to find the cheapest drug that's suitable for them in their geography and, and for their prescription. And what's interesting is, or I guess what people are very familiar with is that one, US healthcare in general is very inefficient. There's a lack of transparency. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why that is. Um, what GoodRx is doing is trying to increase transparency and, and the way they, uh, I don't know how deep I want to get into the prescription value chain or how people are interested in understanding PBMs, but I'll give us high level and we can dig down if you think it's interesting. But um, the way it sort of works is that pharmacy benefit managers, PBMs play a very important role in the pricing of prescription drugs. They're the intermediary between insurance companies who hire them to then manage their prescription pharmacy benefits between pharmacies and also the drug manufacturers. So they're kind of the intermediary between three separate parties. And what this does is kind of creates a lack of price transparency. So pharmacies negotiate with PBMs in order to drive demand, PBMs will drive demand to the pharmacies and will negotiate prices that will they will give to the pharmacy benefit manager clients, insurance members to then go to that pharmacy. And so what that leads to is that the pharmacy themselves at the counter don't know the price of their drugs when the customers are coming. They don't know until they actually like ring up the customer and see what their insurance says it is through their PBM contract. So pharmacies really have no pricing power or really no um, control over the pricing. And that leads into for clients that are insured. So then that gets into the uninsured clients, which has pricing, which is called usual and customary pricing, UNC pricing, where um, they do set that pricing. They can determine what they, that price for any specific drug is. Um, the one important thing to know is um, part of their contracts with the insured PBM um, entities is that their usual and customary pricing cannot, if it's lower than their negotiated price, then their prices of the PBMs go below that. Like it's the lower of the two prices. So what that creates for the pharmacies is to really set this UNC pricing really high as a way to increase their revenue. That's like what their economic incentive is. So what happens are the people that are uninsured have to pay this really crazy high price that is not linked to their wholesale acquisition cost or the cost of goods sold. It could be 10x, 100x what a drug actually costs. And these are often the people in society that are most vulnerable to tough economic hardship or, or prices. And so they're really like making excess profits on the people who don't have insurance. So and that's kind of as deep as I'll go for there. I know that's kind of a lot to probably absorb and you can go deeper into like how the relationships work where GoodRx comes in, or I guess the cash card, the discount card for prescription is they are able to have a, a contract or relationship with a PBM to get access to that pricing, that negotiated pricing. 
And so what GoodRx does, and then we'll let me, you can lead me to wherever you wanna go with follow up questions. What GoodRx does is it aggregates all of the PBMs in the country. So that way it aggregates supply and it picks the lowest price for whichever makes sense for that customer. So they're aggregating supply, aggregating demand, and really gets into Ben Thompson's aggregation theory. So to like use the analogy where GoodRx is kind of like the price line or Expedia um, of prescription drugs, the one caveat which differentiates GoodRx is that Expedia and, and, and bookings.com or whatnot, they potentially can be disintermediated by Google because Google can access airline prices or hotel prices through their search algorithms. Google cannot do that with prescription drugs. There's nowhere to find these prices. And I believe the statistic or the data point is GoodRx aggregates or changes 250 billion different price points every single day. I mean, like the prices for drugs change daily. They change based on, they get a 50 milligrams or versus 100 milligrams or a 30 day supply versus 90 day supply. One, you'll have the same insurance with the same PBM, but if you go to one pharmacy versus another pharmacy, the prices will, there's just thousands, millions, billions of price differences. And GoodRx has done a really good job in aggregating all of these different prices. So Google can't necessarily disintermediate GoodRx. In fact, the pharmacies can't do it. The PBMs can't do it. There's no one else besides the entity who aggregates the PBMs. And, and GoodRx has, there were many other discount cash cards over the last 10 years when they started popping up. Um, GoodRx has kind of taken off as the one that has won the most market share for various different reasons. They have a patent, so they're the only ones that can aggregate multiple PBMs. Um, they had really good relationships with providers or physicians, so they were referred to by the providers who were making the prescriptions, and they had good uh, relationships with the pharmacies, so that way the point of sale, the handoff from online to, to offline was friendly, while well, some other discount cards were trying to go around pharmacies, and so there's different reasons why they were successful, but now um, they have essentially created this marketplace for prescri prescription drug prices where it created that feedback loop, the virtuous cycle where they've aggregated 20 million viewers to their website or you know, high single digit millions in, in, in their subscriber base or the Mac um, monthly af uh, average uh, consumer base. And, and so it's created this point where now they're in a power position with the majority market share offering the best prices. And um, but maybe before I, you, you ask a follow-up question, I'll say another way to maybe think about it which I think is a helpful way is PBMs are similar to like the uh, payment networks. Um, it's like Visa, MasterCard, American Express. And, and so it's very hard to get around these PBMs. The majority of Americans are insured and, and they use this PBM network. It's like a payment network to adjudicate these claims for prescription drugs. Um, the only thing that's different if you think about the payment networks, they charge 200 basis points to use the, their, their network. And that doesn't all go to Visa and MasterCard, they only get a couple of basis points, but it goes as a basically rebate incentive to make people want to use their cards. And it goes through the different players of the payment ecosystem. And so the question is like, why do we have to pay 200 basis points to transact money when it shouldn't be that much it's because of the relationships and whatnot? Anyways, with prescription drugs, could you imagine going to a pharmacy and saying, and this is what it is, like, or anywhere, let's say using the, the payment network analogy and being like, I don't know if they're going to charge me 600 basis points for this transaction or 800 basis points or 2000 basis points or 50 basis points. Like, I don't know how much I'm going to get charged to buy this thing at a retail outlet or anything you want to buy based on a thousand different reasons. Like, and so what GoodRx is essentially doing is aggregating Visa, MasterCard, American Express and telling someone you can use this one because it's the cheapest way to buy a good. And so then it's lowering the costs of the transaction. Um, and what, it's a similar kind of concept where you don't care about which payment network you use. You just wanna buy the good, similar to like prescriptions. You don't care which pharmacy benefit manager you get your pricing through. You just, the drug is a commodity, essentially. You don't care where it comes from. You want this drug and can, can come from anywhere, but you wanna pay the lowest price. And so um, that's what GoodRx is doing is trying to, give you the lowest price by aggregating the supply and lowering the price mechanism in, in the space. Yeah. So that's I mean, a lot. But. <laughs> that's a great explanation though, because it is the, the PBM is the, the central piece 
And I mean, I'm curious about the patent. So I've heard about this patent that GoodRx has where they can be the only one that aggregates multiple PBM supply, but just curious if you had any uh, more details on that and even just the history, it just seems like, it seems odd that that's patentable. Yeah, there's not, but management, management won't give you a ton of information on the patent and it is interesting. It was, I think, granted in 2014 and it was a technology saying that on a single interface, they can have multiple PBMs and have multiple contracts with those PBMs. And there was one other discount card um, provider who had multiple relationships, which from our conversations with people in the industry, it was an infringement on this patent um, potentially, but the, that it gets went away when they acquired that company. <laughs> so, but anyways, uh, so it's kind of weird in the details, but um, the understanding is no other discount card can have multiple relationships with these PBMs and provide it on a single interface. And, and so the next biggest player um, in the discount card, prescription card space is single care, which is maybe 25 or 30% of, of the size of GoodRx is maybe a quarter of the size and, and volume and maybe even revenue. Um, and they have integrated with a pharmacy benefit manager. So they are vertically integrated. So they basically their PBM that's under the same corporate umbrella negotiates the prices um, for their clients. So they're, they don't have the same like marketplace dynamic as what GoodRx has. But yeah, I'm not a patent um, expert, but my understanding is that um, they're the only ones that are able to have this multiple relationship dynamic. Uh, and so it served them to take market share and also to be able to offer the lowest price. I would say that even if they didn't have this patent, I think it did was an advantage early on, but this marketplace winner taking most dynamic eventually takes effect. Um, and so even without the patent, like, it's unlikely that number two or three or four player will be competitive once you gain the market share and start really having more bargaining power over the suppliers. So um, that's that's my two cents on the patent. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. So I read a write up you did on GoodRx a while ago, and one thing I thought that was really interesting that you said was, you know, ideally the situation is the like this. GoodRx in this specific capacity doesn't really have to exist because the PBMs are kind of messed up and it's just like a weird system. So I think it'd be interesting if you talked about that because it, I mean, some bears will say, you know, GoodRx is kind of perpetuating the system that they're giving this rebate back to the PBMs and they're helping them make money off of, you know, uninsured patients that, that, you know, they wouldn't have made money off them otherwise, but I thought you had a really interesting viewpoint on this. Yeah, like in a more perfect world, there'll be complete price transparency for all healthcare needs and or all consumer goods or services. And, and but what I've come to realize is um, you have to see the world for what it is <laughs> and not what you would like it to be. And so we live in this world with these current dynamics, this current infrastructure that isn't ideal. That's how the system is built, similar to like the payment networks. Like, why do we have to pay this? It makes it the system not as efficient as it could be. Um, and with prescription drugs, like people do view GoodRx as like another middleman in a very crowded space of middlemen. Um, but the thing is, what is the solution to this situation? And you can't just hope that the PBMs or pharmacies or, or government will make the system better. In fact, whenever there has been increased regulation or government intervention, that's created more inefficiencies in the space. Um, and so what, how we got comfortable with GoodRx is that they are solving a very important problem of increasing transparency, lowering prices, and they do have a take rate but similar to any type of marketplace, you can think of Apple iOS, Google Play Store, um, again, any of the uh, online travel agencies, like the value is they're increasing this price transparency. They're, they're making it so you can choose where the, the thing that's specifically suited for you. You want this flight to this city with this certain seat, this bag, like this is the right price for you. And, and so with GoodRx, that's what they're doing. And so, there is a, uh, I guess, a thesis where like, eventually they are just 
um, basically having an arbitrage opportunity of the discrepancy of the prices between the PBMs and eventually it's gonna become a fairly priced drugs. But in order to maintain that fa those fair prices with the existing players, the, ex the PBMs, GoodRx still has to exist. You remove GoodRx at end state, those prices will then become all warped again. And so they need to be around to create that price, price transparency um, and efficiency in the market. So it is counterintuitive that there's another middleman taking a take rate, yet consumers are saving significant money from using GoodRx. Um, largely right now is because of the potentially are increasing <laughs> demand because a lot of 30% of prescriptions go unfilled because people can't afford them. So they're actually increasing the market size or they're taking the people that shouldn't be paying UNC fake prices, like prices that make no economic sense. And they're now going to over good directs platform and having access to the system. Um, they were out of the system and now they're in the system. Um, it kind of shows you how warped insurance can potentially get if it's, it's things don't aren't perfectly aligned. And that goes with another thesis of the company, the things that we look for in companies is, is everywhere in life, one of the reasons why things don't work out well is because of the principal agent conflict. Um, it could be in money management, it can be CEO versus the shareholders, it can be where the companies in the value chain aren't aligned with customers. And these, these companies that are really consumer focused, they're aggregating demand, it's in their incentive to provide the best service the customers, which then drives more demand to them. Those are good places to be going forward. Um, it, it's not necessarily like the, the, let's say cable operators where they had the worst customer service, you couldn't get anyone on the phone, but like it was a monopoly, you were stuck, you had to use them. That was their provider in your certain area. Um, on the internet, when things are in a more intangible world um, of networks, being a cons very consumer friendly is, is a good place to be. And once you win the market, like let's say Google, then you have to be a, a cognizant of monopoly, monopolistic type of, of uh, strategies that might not be in the consumer interest. It's, uh, it's a different dynamic of monopolies, this current age. Uh, I'm sure you've read the book like Modern Monopolies or Capitalism um, or what was the book? Uh, Capitalism Without Capital. Uh, uh, Historically, a lot of the monopolies were the, the companies that controlled supply, restricted access to supply, and then they had premium pricing. And so customers had not a lot of options and they had to go through this certain supplier, this monopoly, this IBM or, or um, any other the monopolies of the, the 1900s. Going forward, supply is being opened up. It's, it's, it's no longer, it, it, there's a proliferation of supply generally, especially with intangible supply, intangible goods um, with no distribution costs, uh, very low transaction costs. And now it's in, in aggregating the demand. And, and so like these monopolies benefit from providing the best consumer experience. Um, I think, well, if, if we get to Redfin later on this conversation, it's, that's a similar dynamic, but in the real world where, um, it's not just an intangible supply. It's a different type of dynamic from like, it's like a more of an Uber, Airbnb type of dynamic versus just like a Google, Facebook. There, there is no supply issue of transporting it. But anyways, that's a little tangent. Yeah, really interesting. So if you look out 10 years and do your mental exercise, what is like the ideal end state of kind of uh, this mix of parties and, and where does GoodRx occupy in, in that space? Yeah, there are so many potential scenarios. And the way I think about it, most of them are very favorably viewed with, or Good, GoodRx will um, do very well in most of those scenarios. But there's a lot of optionality baked into the potential value um, proposition of GoodRx. They can continue aggregating PBMs and, and providing trace price transparency and lowering um, the cost of prescription drugs and can continue in that forever. But if you wanna like use, do this mental exercise, it's potential, like you can see it in some of their, their corporate endeavors or their, their different things that they're working on other products. They're aggregating more and more consumers, more and more demand where they're becoming very powerful in the value chain. And so that gives them options and they can continue working with PBMs, but they could potentially be the sole PBM that can almost disintermediate PBMs. And I don't, they, like management won't say that, and I don't know if that will actually be the case, but like it's possible they can prevent 
potentially provide insurance to their consumers for the really expensive drugs. And then you can see maybe how there's some manufacturer solutions that are going directly to the drug manufacturers to help with these payments. But like, if they can understand um, the risk of, of, of adherence or, or, or the risk of, of just insurance or liabilities of people that need to these drugs, like they could potentially be a vertically integrated healthcare provider. Um, they're going direct to consumer today, but they're increasingly potentially going to go to corporations. Because I guess where I'm getting at too is when someone uses GoodRx, they're going outside the insurance. They're not using insurance, but the PBM is benefiting because the PBM has negotiated, negotiated this price with the pharmacy. Today, that's good for insurance. Insurance doesn't have a claim. They still get the premiums though. So again, they're covering the people that are potentially insured, but they're, those people that want this prescription aren't having a claim. So insurance doesn't have to pay for it. So right now insurance is benefiting from GoodRx. PBMs are benefiting from GoodRx because they're getting more demand. And so they get a little adjudication fee. Um, but the question is, the reason why companies hire insurance companies is to cover benefits. Why would companies be willing to pay premiums to insurance companies if the benefits aren't as good as a free option as GoodRx? And that's where you start getting into the question of like, companies could potentially say, well, we will use GoodRx specifically. Um, maybe GoodRx will offer some type of discount or subsidy to a company or something to have a benefit to their, their employees and they will remove the insurance for the prescriptions. But so then insurance companies will start suffering and GoodRx will benefit. But then part of the reason why GoodRx has attractive pricing is because they use the PBMs who have the members that have the negotiated prices. So it's going to be kind of interesting to see how it transitions between the power positions and the value chain to as GoodRx aggregates more and more demand. But you can see how there's different scenarios, how they go around insurance, they go around PBMs. They have a subscription product that I think is extremely inter interesting. And it's management's putting a lot of effort and, and resources behind where they're working directly with pharmacies to offer, it's like $6.99 or, or $10.99 for a family to, to get highly discounted um, uh, generic drugs through GoodRx. Um, and they work with a few PBMs, like one or two PBMs. And, the, and, and that's kind of interesting because now they're bundling in highly discounted prescriptions. You also get mail order pharmacy if they, that's something you want. You can also use telehealth through GoodRx. So they're starting to bundle into these different uh, services in the subscription where potentially they're making the Amazon Prime of healthcare. So like that's one way where they will continue to bundle in services and it's not impossible to see a world where a lot of the households in the US have GoodRx as a bundled healthcare provider. Um, so it's, there's a lot of things into it. What's important though, like thinking 10 years out, 15 years out is what is GoodRx doing, which is increasing transparency, lowering the cost of prescriptions, um, that's the value proposition. And why can't other companies do the same thing? And, and I don't see any other company that's able to do that. And I think one of the biggest risks is a complete overhaul of the US health system. But that's the same thing if they would, it's a complete overhaul of the US payment system or a complete overhaul of the auto industry. Like it's unlikely to happen. Like even in that type of situation, usually it increases um, inefficiencies, similar to like Obamacare. You would think Obamacare would have hurt GoodRx, but GoodRx actually thrived because Good Obamacare spread health insurance to everyone, but they didn't stop the costs of health insurance. So now the costs are still there. More people are insured, but the reason now that there's all these costs, companies put in, in, in insurance push the costs onto consumers with high deductible plans. So now they're on the line for the first 2,000, 4,000 uh, costs of any healthcare. So then people that are insured through these high deductible plans benefit from GoodRx. So GoodRx thrived under that, even though you would have think if there's more insurance to go around, like GoodRx wouldn't benefit. Similar to like expansion of Medicare or Medicaid, things like that. What's important is that GoodRx is providing lower prices over time and how that works out will be interesting to watch. Um, they can continue in their current route. They can increase the subscription bundled product. Um, they can potentially go directly to drug manufacturers one day. I don't, there's so many different scenarios. And I have confidence in management because they're very entrepreneurial. They're very like willing to try different things and test things and iterate. 
Um, and that's important, I think, when you have so much optionality baked into your value proposition. Yeah, super interesting going through all of that. And I thought it was interesting you made the point about the insurance companies, how they love it right now, but companies are actually paying for this as a benefit. They're like, well, you're not actually doing anything for us. Um, one, I also think the subscription product is interesting because it feels like the party in all of this system that, you know, really gets the short end of the stick is the pharmacies where, you know, they were receiving this high price. Now they get RX, you know, you get a good RX barcode and you go up to the pharmacy and the pharmacy kind of rolls their eyes like, oh, we, we can't really you know, do anything about that, you know, good or X will say we're driving foot traffic through the store because, uh, you know, however many you said 30% of prescriptions go unfilled. And I'm just curious about your thoughts on pharmacies specifically, um, and how it relates to this whole ecosystem. Yeah, uh, those are all good points and correct points where pharmacies are a very important touch point um, from that's the point of sale for GoodRx. And part of the reason why GoodRx succeeded over others, um, there was one uh, discount cash card that didn't succeed because they tried to go around pharmacies. So pharmacies actively like try to stop them. And, and with GoodRx, I worked with pharmacies and it's true, pharmacies are not, no, why is anyone paying usual and customary prices, right? Like that's just, that doesn't make any sense. And that's taking margin away from pharmacies. And so that's something to consider, but the question is, is that fair either? pharmacies like the CVSs and Walgreens of the world potentially view um, their pharmacy, the prescriptions as not a loss maker, but not a huge um, profit center because they do increase foot traffic and like they'll buy higher margin consumer goods, packaged goods. Um, what's interesting just in evaluating value chains over time, I remember it was in, it was in good and good to great, the book where they like profiled like, 10 or 15 companies that were like the best companies. Like, and I'm pretty sure wasn't, was it Walgreens or CVS was one of the companies that was profiled? I think, I think it was so. maybe Walgreens. Um, and like, it's not done so well over the, the, the subsequent like 10 or 15 or 20 year period since the book is written. And it's so funny for 20 years, they were um, aggregate or they were consolidating um, the pharmacy, like independent players throughout the country. They were growing in this, this retail outlet for drugs. And now it's not really a power position per se. Um, uh, it, it, they, they haven't had as much success, I think, because I think they have lost their, their power position to PBMs who are in a much more powerful place because they've aggregated demand for the pharmacy and the pharmacies are really don't have a lot of bargaining power. Um, you look at their profit margins, you look at Rite Aid. <laughs> Rite Aid would be one experience or one company, but CVS and Walgreens, CVS has tried to obviously vertically integrate and go into, they own a PBM, they own an insurance company. So they try to um, have different parts, own different parts of the value chain that's integrated. Um, I think independent pharmacies will be struggling and they have struggled. You look at their any available financials on them, it's, it's a tough business. They try to you know focus on maybe specialty drugs that have a higher margin, but I don't, think that um, pharmacy is not the power position. It's a, their important touch point in the value chain. Um, and I think they do benefit from foot traffic. So you can see like Wal uh, Walmart has had their four and 10 or their $4 generics. And they do that because they actually price their UN, the UNC pricing really low. So they're actually lowering their profits from PBMs or insured clients who will then use their $4 or $10 generics. And then they'll gain obviously margin at the other products that they'll buy in Walmart. Um, it's just interesting to see how the value chains do change. I, I, one of the risks potentially like is, is for GoodRx would be like if like Amazon. So like Amazon's like try to enter the space and they're, they're trying to um, do mail delivery and they're trying to have that product after um, yeah, so like they, they've moved into that area about a year ago when they announced that they were, they were having Amazon Pharmacy and they have a discount card provider, but they're still working within the system of PBMs and, and insured pricing. But if Amazon for some reason said, we're going to go outside of the system and do like a cost plus type of model. Um, so that way we will not accept insurance and, and we're going to try to win that way because it's such an, an efficient market that would be interesting. But the thing is, if you look back at other companies that have tried to do that, it's been unsuccessful. Um, 
mail order has not been a very, uh, uh, consumers don't value it that much today. I'm sure there'll be increased use of mail order, but prescription drugs aren't like books or anything else, electronics, like temperature matters. You have to be there when it's delivered. Timing is very important. So you need to immediately, like it's all, so there's a lot more and there's the regulations surrounding. So there's a lot of issues to go around that. Um, I don't think, even Amazon, who has a touch point to almost every household in the US, I don't even know if they have the scale potentially to like negotiate with drug manufacturers to get, or I guess wholesalers to get like really attractive pricing. And um, Mark Cuban has something where they're, he's trying to like have a vertically integrated um, offering where he actually will manufacture some, some generics, ha have a PBM and then offer that um, online. And I just think it would it's, it would be very hard to get the volume when you're trying to compete against the PBMs or other products. So it's something to watch and be interested in. But like to I guess address your question specifically about pharmacies, they are looking I think towards other profit centers and, and prescriptions is a tough business, especially gen I mean it's generics. It's literally a commodity, and so they're just selling it. And what's important in in some like this value chain is not distribution there's pharmacies in every corner of every street like the problem to solve is pricing transparency it's not distribution and that's that's very i think um key so that's how i think about i guess I guess pharmacies and, and their their position in the value chain but they're an important player i think are going to be more interested in like foot traffic and, and trying to drive foot traffic speaking about amazon like doing like amazon would not doesn't have foot traffic obviously but hopefully like i guess that would be a strategy where they would want people to use Amazon more and be more engaged in their prime product. But like, I think it would be a difficult endeavor. Mm. Yeah, no, that's super helpful. Um, so I think you did an amazing job breaking down GoodRx. Is there any other sections of the business or um, risk or, or whatever that you wanted to talk about before I move on to Redfin? Yeah, no, that was, I'm glad that I broke it down. It's a complex thing on the surface, a complex like ecosystem. But I think when you actually break it apart, it's very few, it, it kind of, I, I mean, I don't want to like build this investment up, but there are components of it that remind me of Trade Desk. <laughs> and I don't want to like, cause like you look at the success of Trade Desk and but I remember when we looked at it, like they, I remember having this, this understanding the ecosystem of, it, of the ad tech ecosystem and thinking it's kind of confusing on the surface, but once you realize they're, what they're doing by aggregating supply, essentially commoditizing supply, um, Trade Desk doesn't care if you advertise on Spotify or Google or anywhere else on the internet. They just want to have the best ROI. They don't care if Apple iOS 14 will impact it because like if that's a lower ROI, they'll just funnel the ad somewhere else. And there's that component of it, but also the increasing barriers to entry. Like there are economies of scale to the Trade Desk where you could see that they were taking market share, they were winning, they were providing the best value proposition to customers. And I couldn't, you could, I couldn't see how anyone could compete with them. Um, I kind of, I see that with GoodRx where a startup discount cash card wouldn't exist. Like they won't be successful going forward today. And absent a complete, I think, overhaul or regulatory change in, in how prescription drugs work or something to that extent, I just don't see how they could be stopped. Like even like PBM concentration is something to think about. Like 75% of prescriptions go through three um, PBMs. But it is, gets into the prisoner dilemma situation where unless those three PBMs and all the other, I mean, not just those three PBMs, um, all the other PBMs, the 12 to 15 that GoodRx works, all work together to like conspiracize against GoodRx and like basically price fix, one of them will likely not and they'll provide the attractive pricing and then they'll all fall. Like, like you can go back to all the different real live historic situations of prisoners dilemmas and that's typically what happens whether it's oil in the middle, middle east or whatever you can have um whatever situation it is and so like i don't see how good it would be very difficult for them to to be have a, a competitor that replaces them i think i mean i could be wrong this is all like this but this is a situation where i kind of there's a lot of similarities to i think the trade desk um the, the one caveat is trade desk was trading at a much lower multiple than what GoodRx was trading at. Um, when we first invested in Trade Desk, GoodRx, the idea is they have no cost of supply. Like they can scale infinitely. Like a customer goes to GoodRx, they can go to any pharmacy. There is no cost of supply. That's why their gross profit margins are over 90%, 95% in their prescription business. Um, so they, 
literally the only thing holding them back is consumer adoption, where like 70% of consumers don't even know you, you, you can have different prices at the pharmacy for prescriptions. They don't even, they're not aware. So like you have to drive consumer adoption. It's the same uh, idea of like when Amazon was scaling, why would it take Amazon? They scaled at like the same rate as like Walmart in the seventies and eighties. Why Amazon, which is an e-commerce site and has huge warehouses, why did it take, was growing at 20 to 30% year after year after year? Like why can't it grow 50%, 60% like higher? It's consumer adoption. It takes a while for people to be familiar. But when people realize or you speak about people using GoodRx, it's just like, wow, this the product is amazing. Um, so anyways, that's just a little uh, caveat, but I think it's a very interesting situation. Yeah, it's true. I mean, when people haven't heard of it, it's like, wait, this is free money? What's the catch? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so, like speaking about the valuation work, um, it's like this potential space is very large um, and, and GoodRx's volume is only low single digit percentages of the potential TAM. Um, but there's nothing holding it back to becoming 10%, 15%, 20% of volume one day. Um, so yeah, it's a very scalable business. So it, it's, it deserves a higher multiple, but even when you look at it, like it's selling for, I think 16 or 70 times it's gross profits growing at a high rate. And the question is like, what will slow the rate? And this is a situation where there's increasing returns to scale, the bigger good works gets the more powerful it gets. And there's no like, tangible assets holding down like economies of scale that become this economies of scale it actually gets stronger so it's possible that their growth accelerates or at least is consistent most models in wall street and i i was on the sell side for a couple of years and i know how people model things two or three years out you always think growth will slow um which makes sense because that's how most businesses work like that's a good mental model to use but there's a few businesses where they actually become stronger the bigger they get and google's are is the prime example how is it able to grow 20 30 percent at a 250 billion dollar run rate it's crazy so it's a it's, it's an interesting business model yeah no that's really interesting well i think you did a great job breaking down good rx um do you want to jump in to redfin i think people have like a better understanding of yeah you know what the supply chain of, of redfin yeah, but when, um yeah just go for it yeah when we were talking before we started recording I said maybe we should talk about GoodRx first because people will be mentally exhausted probably by the time if, if we do that at the end no one will understand what, what's going on <laughs> with Redfin it's very more clear I think because it's um it's a it's a real estate brokerage um and uh what they're doing is they're trying to use their online portal their website to he help aggregate demand and, and drive demand to their real life brokerage of agents. And what's interesting about Redfin, or I guess just the, again, another very in, inefficient industry, something where the fees paid to agents or brokerages has not been susceptible to um, competition um, for, sell, for a selling agent or a buyer agent, they usually charge two and a half to 3%. So six, five to 6% 6 for the transaction of a house. Um, and that has not been, that has not been competed down like many other spaces that have had technology and talking about like marketplaces or online marketplaces and, and how that might differentiate to like real world situations um is that you can see redfin and most people don't even know redfin's a brokerage but they actually like the way they make money is by buying and selling houses making the transaction of the real estate um transaction more efficient for consumers and, and, and sellers of homes um the the more pure play tech uh, marketplaces like Zillow. And so Zillow obviously is the biggest real estate website in the country. They have, I don't even know, 200 million users or visitors a year. And um, and they, the way that their business model works is that they sell advertising to agents. So agents will pay them to then have priority, like to help funnel demand or a lead generator. And that works, like that model works um, for when uh, I guess the transaction is efficient or there's not like actual, uh, the, the supply, like getting the supply is efficient, which is like an intangible good. Like Google is the great, best, best example. But when there's some difference in how people find homes to sale and then the actual selling process, the way to fix the value chain to align the incentives is by integrating, by actually being the brokerage. Because 
Otherwise, the brokers or the agents, they're not going to lower the fees that they charge. They just want to get more demand. Um, and so you actually have to control the agents and actually say we're charging less and we have to become more efficient. So we have to have higher turnover so we can charge lower fees. And that's what Redfin is trying to do and has done for 15, 16 years at this point. Um, and the story, I guess, like the long term, if you like want to talk about where they are now and where we think they will be in 10 or 15 years, um, the U.S. real estate industry has the highest fees in the world generally on average and the reason why that is is because we have seller and buyer agents and there's no price competition between them there's no price transparency or negotiation um at least on the buy side more so on the sell side so most countries only have a selling agent and so buyers will find the house and like it'll be a two and a half percent fee for the value of the home in the u.s buy side agents became more popular in the 80s and the 90s and so i think that over time Redfin will make it increase transparency, increase the ability for consumers to find the homes, and then actually put together a contract via Red, what, uh, Redfin's portal and pay a much lower fee to Redfin, 1% for Redfin Direct versus paying 25 or 3% for, for the buyer's agent. I guess to even go back further is like, the buyers can't even negotiate the fee that pay, they pay the agent that they hire. Like that's one reason why it's an, e an efficient market. It's the seller who is more price sensitive because they hire the agent and they, they are a little bit more price sensitive, but then it's baked into the contract what the buyer's agent will receive once they sell the house. And so whenever, if anyone who buys a house, they, you go to an agent, they say, oh, you don't even pay the fee. Well, of course you pay the fee. You're, who's writing the check? Like the, the money's coming from somewhere and it's, it's you, you're buying the house, which is then forwarded to the agents. Um, that's, so I think once people are more, once there's more transparency and understand how the fees work, and, and there's currently the Department of Justice is, is analyzing the real estate industry practices of the NAR, which is a very powerful organization, uh, National Association of Realtors, um, and trying to figure out if there's a way to separate that fee of this buyer and the seller. So the way the buyer says, I'll pay, negotiate their fee with their agent and the seller will negotiate their fee with their agent. Um, that would be a very important component. But after that whole long rant, the general thesis, and we can dig into any specific questions, the general thesis is Redfin is lowering the transaction costs of buying and selling homes by integrating with their online website portal, owning the broker, the, the real estate agent, so they're more efficient. So because they don't have to spend so much time to find demand, it just goes to their website. They can sell much more, many, a lot more homes per an agent. And so then they lower the cost of actually the, the, the fees of transacting real estate. And I have this deep seated belief in the consumers that they're very price sensitive over time. And people, people like to pay lower prices for the same, if not better service. I really think that's something that people generally like. And I think Redfin's doing that where they are charging less um, and they're making the, the transaction more efficient and no other broker, no other real estate company, not Zillow, not any of the other publicly large traded brokerages are, are doing it to the same extent. So I can talk about anything more specific. I was a long rant all over the place for Redfin. <laughs> no, that's good. So you mentioned at the beginning, Zillow getting out of eye buying and how that's obviously a very important consideration for the whole space. So I'd just be curious to hear your thoughts on because I know eye buying isn't necessarily, you know, like huge yet for Redfin, but would just be curious to hear what your thoughts were and what your process for analyzing Zillow stepping out of that uh, were. Yeah, so eye buying is institutional buying. So companies like Zillow and Redfin and Open Door are institutions that are trying to make buying and selling a house. Like they basically will buy instant liquidity and they'll flip the house. It's just an institution flipping a house. It's, I guess if you wanna use a similar company in a different industry, it's like Carvana, like it's Carvana will give you an offer and they'll flip it and they'll take ownership of the inventory. But obviously homes are a much different <laughs> type of uh, supply. Homes are in much higher risk. Um, so Redfin's and I buying. And it's a good thing for the business because it's not their core business. Their core business is the brokerage. Their eye buying business is generally a lead generator. It's a way, it's, it's a, a, a part of their business. And so someone who's trying to sell their home will go to Redfin 
and they'll be interested in what they could get if they were to sell it immediately within a week and Redfin will buy it from them. Generally, like the way Redfin approaches is it approaches iBuying is that they'll give them about 15% lower like value or whatever it is in that market um, discount to the price that they could sell if they put it on the market and try to sell it um, on the open market, usually within 30 to 90 days. And I'll explain to them, like, we can buy it with, from you today and give you this price, or like you can potentially use us as an agent and we'll probably get a much higher price. And so some people choose I buying because they need instant liquidity, whether they're moving up, like buying a bit larger house or they need to move immediately or whatever reason may be. So they have grown I buying. Zillow um, in 2018, I think started realizing that their lead generator business of their website was starting to stagnate a little bit. Their growth was slowing and they were looking for growth and, and, and to maybe try to disrupt the real estate market by really leaning into iBuying. And so they made a big push into being a huge iBuyer across the country. Um, they were more aggressive, I think, in, in how they're pricing the homes. And so they got ahead of themselves this year and I think realized it was a very risky business that they were trying to make their main business. And they got out in, what was it, September or whatnot, they made an announcement that they were basically getting out of the business because they, it was just too risky for them. Um, from a Redfin standpoint, how that things like Redfin's always been more conservative about how they approach the business and, and nothing has changed or from management, like they're not changing how they're going about it from, I guess, a com competition standpoint. Um, it's good, like, right? Fewer competitors means that it's probably going to benefit those that stay in the market. Um, I think even deeper, what's more important, it's not just looking at the iBuyer business, but I viewed the potential largest risk to Redfin was Zillow because if Zillow ever decided to be a full-on brokerage like Redfin, they're the only company, maybe realtor.com, like th those are the top three websites, Zillow, realtor.com and Redfin. And the next actual traditional brokerage is like multiple smaller than, than Redfin. But if Zillow ever wanted to use their huge demand that people go to their website and then try to disrupt real estate, and hopefully Zillow's not watching this, but and try to like actually um, own, bro like actually hire agents full-time salaried um, and then lowered fees because they did have all this demand, then that would be kind of a direct threat to Redfin. Because right now Redfin and Zillow aren't directly competing with each other. They are to a certain degree in, in trying to like aggregate supply and get viewership, but the real business is the brokerage. I always thought that was unlikely for Zillow to do that. One, because Zillow's core customers are agents. So there's a customer conflict um, where they would basically be competing with their existing cash flowing business, a really high cash flow generating business. Um, and their whole ethos is supporting those agents. And, and so while Redfin's whole corporate ethos and culture is trying to improve the customer's experience and lower costs for customers like, and consumers. And so what you look at in other real estate brokerages or other, um, you can look at I don't name names for uh, Compass or EXP or those companies, they serve the agent. Their customer is the agent. They're trying to do everything they can to help the agent. And that's great. Like actually like, that does make the transaction probably better if there's a great agent operating system and, and they, they're more efficient. But then the agent's still charging the same price to the customer. Like they're not passing on those cost savings. They're just helping the agents make more money. And so unless you actually integrate and, and really control the agents, then you're not going to actually lower the costs in the industry and they're going to stay elevated. And so with Zillow getting out of iBuying, um, it's good from an iBuying perspective, but even more importantly, I don't see Zillow taking any huge business risks going forward. The CEO has said like we are focusing on our capital light cash generating website, our tech business. And that's not re what Redfin is. Redfin is a service oriented capital. It's a very capital intensive business when you look at it from hiring people full time. It's a logistically complicated operating business. And, and that's very hard to replicate. So even if Zillow tried to do what Redfin is, I think they would really struggle. They'd have to change a whole ethos. They would have to like, it's not easy. And you can see that because Redfin actually was the first um, website that, that had home search like before Zillow, they're both in Seattle, but um, they decided that they wanted to disrupt real estate and actually make it better and not just be a normal like tech company as a lead generator. And so I really don't see like what if Zillow and Compass wanted to combine? Like that would, but like, again, 
they completely focus on the agent. They're not focusing on the end consumer. And so it's hard to build Redfin. Like if you're thinking about like the S curve, um, they're still early. It's this huge $2 trillion of values exchange, exchange and own values in the US and $100 billion in, in agent fees or commissions. They're still very early in the cycle, but it's a very local business, a very local. Like you have to hire agents in each geography supported by this nationwide um, website. So it's combining this tech with a very local business that takes the time to scale. But once they scale it, it's it's a very scalable business model as they've grown um, 20 to 30% annualized in the brokerage business over time. But it's not one of those that will grow 60% or 70% or 50%, like some of the companies you'll see in that market today that are like internet companies. But, so mm. that's the that's, uh, overview on Redfin. Do you think iBuying is valid? Like, have you done a lot of work on Open Door? Yeah, I mean, I've looked at them and, and we own Carvana. So like, I'm very um, attuned to like that type of mental model or that concept where you vertically integrate and you're trying to make the transaction efficient and you actually own the inventory. Um, but I think, I mean, my understanding is it's it's a much riskier business. It's very, it's even more cyclical than autos it's it's very interest rate sensitive and i would view if your sole business is i buying it's very risky if it's a part of your business that is a lead generator for your core business it's a plus and um uh i would i don't want to talk like negative about businesses but like open door or like zillow or or any other uh, other potential i buyers like it's just I, I think they will struggle. Like, I just think that if the next downturn will be really tough on those companies, it's it's a very capital intensive business um, supported by leverage. Um, so I just think it would be tough. It's, it's not something that I think, I, I could be wrong, but like, I would rather have, the other thing is like Redfin has that demand all automatically with their website, which is what Zillow also had. And they're trying to monetize some of that demand. Open door doesn't necessarily have that. And so they have to spend a little bit more, I think, on customer acquisition costs. Um, and then when a customer doesn't want to sell to open door, then they can't monetize that customer. They can't actually be like, well, we can try selling your house through a traditional open market uh, sale. Um, what's key, I think, like going a little bit further in, in Redfin being successful or whoever might be successful is, is really providing, like controlling more supply. Um, and like I was saying, like the monopolies of the past controlled supply, well, in the real estate market, MLSs, the listing services, um, they control, they're like the little monopolies in each little geography. And you had to list your house on that in order to likely sell it. And that's where like the brokerage commission, like fixed, fixed pricing essentially <laughs> came into play. Um, so that no one will ever control supply because now that the internet makes um, information just prevalent and everyone can kind of link into MLS to a certain degree on their data systems, Redfin charges 1% fee if you buy and sell to Redfin or 1.5%. So the more people that list in Redfin, um, that will mean that they likely will control more of that supply. So they can use their technology for instant bookings or tours, or they can actually when Redfin Direct potentially takes off and however long it will take, like you might have to list your house with Redfin to then put an online offer. So like that way you get more demand on your listing if you list with Redfin. So like that might incentivize more people to actually sell through Redfin. Um, that's important, but I think that Open Door or the other iBuyer don't necessarily have that advantage that Redfin has with, with um, being able to monetize more of their users through other, other services. Yeah, that it makes a lot of sense. It, it is so. I mean, do you think Open Door will, you know, kind of attach on a, a brokerage uh, to a certain extent so that they can do that piece? If so, potentially, like you always have these game theory like scenarios sure. that you like work through, but it would be, I think, very hard for them to replicate the website component, and so. Um, that's a big advantage for Redfin. So, but you can play in the different scenarios. Like what if Open Door and Zillow combined, right? Like then they would have that advantage. Um, and so it's possible, but uh, I doubt it. Like, I just don't think that's part of like what their mission is or their goal is. Like they are 
trying to be like Carvana. Like they really want to be the flipping business um, for homes. And if they were a brokerage, that's not kind of part of what they're trying to do. What Redfin's trying to do is like just make the transaction as seamless as possible, lower the costs, the frictional cost of buying and selling homes in whatever way that's as possible. So like potentially like, and there's so many different um, services that people demand. And some people like their handheld when they buy, like they want a buyer's agent because it's a very infrequent high risk transaction for most people that uh, it just happens what every eight, nine, 10, 15 years. It's very um, risky to, if it gets wrong. So like they want their handheld. And so you have to kind of offer kind of a menu of services to be able to address the, address a lot of the market. And um, it's hard to build a company that offers all these different services or has this like online portal. And, and, and Revan has been building it for 15 plus years. And like, it just takes a lot of time. The other thing that's good about Redfin is like, they are conservative in their investments. Like Compass, which is a tech broke brokerage, they've come out of nowhere almost. Like they have been gaining market share in the higher end of, of homes in many of the, like the big urban cities, but they invest heavily. Like they invest a lot when they go into a market, they hire agents that are very expensive, offer them stock and all the different things. And so Redfin doesn't invest as heavily in each market because they want to be conservative. They really are trying to assess what is the demand in Cleveland or LA or Seattle. Um, and then we will hire an agent when we think there's demand for them to be hired. Like they're not going to go way in front of their skis or try to way in advance of demand because that's risky. And like Glenn Kellman is very like conservative, I think, with how he's trying to grow this company. He's like, we could grow at 70 or 80 percent a year. We can just hire agents all over the place. Um, but like they wouldn't be the great agents that we require to provide the customer service and, and um, it potentially like real estate's a cyclical market, like then we would have a problem in a downturn. So like, they're always like trying to grow um, systematically, methodically um, in a, a conservative manner. And it's funny because I, I talked to a, lot, a few other people about Redfin and it's like, why aren't they growing faster? Like, why haven't they had more success? And like, you look at their growth and like, they've grown about 30% a year for 50, you know, forever. <laughs> I mean, the growth has been about 30%, maybe the year over year it's declined because they had a strong end of 2020. But I'm like, it's so funny that people think that's really slow growth, like in this market today, like that's, but what I'm more interested in is like durable growth, like growth that is sustainable. Like I don't want something that grows and then like basically drops, like something that's sustainable. And that's what Redfin's building is like that technology, the ecosystem, the vertical integration with, with real estate agents off, offering a really good customer value proposition. Like that's more interesting to me that they have durable growth over 10, 20, 30 years. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, so I feel like I've kept you a long time, but is there anything <laughs> more that you want to talk about on Redfin before a closing question? No, um, I got, I, I just think like comparing, like, I guess the marketplace type of business model, it's, it's different from the ones that are just online. And I think getting into this real world, solving this problem of operations and hiring real people, it's, it's similar to like Uber where, they had to like organize car drivers and stuff. And that was hard operationally. And they figured it out and they were able to scale faster. Doing it with agents and, and integrating with them is even harder. Um, and so it takes longer, but like, I think solving real world problems. I, I, I love finding companies that are hard to build, but pretty easy to understand. Like the thesis is easy because like then it's probably hard to replicate what they're doing. And so I think Redfin's one of those businesses that it's very difficult to do what they're doing and they have shown a good track record over a long period of time of being able to execute. So it's, it's I think, pretty, um, it's pretty easy to ex extrapolate that far into the future. And, and I think that it'll be, it'll be an interesting company to see what it looks like in 2030 or 2040, so. Hmm. Yeah, I, I like that mental model of, you know, something that's, that's actually very hard operationally, but easy to understand. That, that's really good. Carvana is a great example of that type of mm -hmm. model. Trupanion, you know, like those are the companies that are just so hard to build. They seem easy. Like I remember on the last call with Carvana, the CEO, and they were dealing with like supply chain issues or inventory. And Ernie Garcia was like saying, they're executing so well. 
despite how hard it is. Like they, they make it look easy. It's not easy. <laughs> it's very difficult. We can look at their competitors. It's very hard to do. But you look at the numbers and you're like, wow, like this company, it, it can't be that hard. But like, it's just because they're so good at executing. They've proven that they can. So yeah, if you find those companies that make it look easy, even though it's, it's not easy, um, it, usually they're pretty durable. They have durable advantages. Mm. Yeah, that's good. Well, thanks so much, Joe, for breaking down GoodRx and Redfin. Definitely. Um, I thought that was, that was really great. Um, so just a, a closing question. I'm curious if you uh, have any like investment advice that people like to give that you actually think is uh, counterproductive. Oh, investing advice that is counterproductive. I, I don't have a good answer. I think like if you're just pursuing investing, what's worked for me is just following your interests, like being curious. And so if you feel like, like I, when you're younger, you're like, I need to find a, an idea today, or I need to find this many ideas a month or a year. I need to like, and you have this feeling you always have, you can always be doing something like there's always something to learn and there's always stock prices change every single day. So you have thousands of opportunities and they constantly are changing. So it's a little overwhelming. I have found that you just follow your interests and you just try to like, you're like a detective and you're just trying to like figure out how things work. And like, I just thinking back over the last 10 years, I remember sitting and being like, cable sucks. Like I'm like the cable experience for the consumer is awful. And I'm like, it has to be better. It has to be better. And then you, and then over time you start thinking through this and then you kind of come about like Roku or like you come about Amazon fire or like this, these, and like, this is interesting. And then you start learning about it. Similar to, I remember thinking like advertising online digitally, like that is going to be huge. Like that is so like, you look at Google, you look at Facebook. And then I'm like thinking like, whoever can figure this out, if there is some type of advantage, this will be really interesting. And you just like have this in your mind for years. You just are thinking about this and you come across a trade desk and you're like, oh my, this is interesting. And I had the same experience for like Redfin. Like I remember I bought a house three years ago. It was not the best experience. I had an okay experience, but it could have been much better with my buyer's agent. Um, and like thinking like this, like there has to be a better way. Like there has to be. And I kept on thinking about this and we owned LGI homes for years and I, they're a home builder. And like, so I was kind of understanding of the value chain of, of the housing industry. And like, I didn't understand how Redfin fit in there versus like Zillow versus all the other companies. And then you start digging, through it. And it was literally like six or seven months ago, I started really picking away at Redfin. I'm like, this is something that's really interesting and really special. You just keep on searching. Same thing with GoodRx. Like these things come about and you're like, it just sparks your interest and you start digging and digging. I think I don't wake up every day saying like, I need to find an idea or I need, like, I just want to learn. And through that learning, maybe an idea pops up and it might be in five years ago, five years from now or 10 years from now. But like, I think like it's, it can be very stressful to feel like you have to be doing something or you have to be looking for an idea. So I think the investing process works best when you're just curious and you're constantly looking and, and trying to learn and not, it, it can be discouraging if you go months without a new idea or years without a new idea. Don't force it. It's not worth forcing it. Not, you don't want to lose money. <laughs> like if that's, Don't forget rule number one in investing. Um, so that's worked for me at least. And everyone has their own different process and their own philosophy, but what's worked for me is like, just follow your interests and, and try to just be a detective and look for things and solve puzzles and, and enjoy it and make it fun. Because if you're in this for the long term, a long term game, it can be exhausting if it causes stress or, or, or if you don't enjoy it, like you have to enjoy it and looking at the market every single day, looking at Twitter. And like seeing the people's responses of stocks up. I don't even know what the market's doing today. I, I try not to look at the market day to day until it's closed, unless I'm actively trying to buy something or sell something or invest in a new account, because like it's just a distraction. Like focus on what's important. And uh, if you can focus and figure out signal versus noise, it's, it makes the whole process much better and more fun. Hmm. Amazing advice. And yeah, it's so good too, because if you, are curious about it and you're actually genuinely interested in it, you'll go way deeper than the person who's just doing it for the money or, or whatever. So I think it, that's very, very wise advice. For people that want investing, the goal is to make more money, right? You put more money out today to get more money in the future. For people professionally doing this, like if you're doing this for the money, that's, there are so many other ways in this world to make a lot of money. Be a really good, if you're smart and you're work hard, be a doctor, be a software engineer, 
be a content influencer. Like there's a thousand different ways to make a lot of money. Like money management, it's, it's, it's doesn't make sense because like the, I think you'll do best when you're not in it for the money, even though it's like, if you approach it from a puzzle and you enjoy the process, but if you're trying to make a buck through fees of investing other people's money, um, it's, it's, there's so much better ways to do it. Do it because you love it, right? Like do it because you're passionate because the best investors will be doing it for 10, 20, 30 years. And like, if you don't love it, you won't stick around for long term. Hmm. Exactly. Hey, well, thanks so much, Joe. Um, I always love having you on. So thanks for taking the time. Thanks, Ryan. This was a lot of fun. Enjoyed it. All right.